Welcome to Paintbrush and Ivories, the podcast for artists and curious creatives that connects creativity with the heart and soul. I'm Michelle Walker, and I'm here with my creative soul sister, Jennifer Ruth Russell. Hi, Jennifer. Hey, Michelle. How wonderful it is to be here with you, your curious mind and your loveliness. (laughs) Welcome, welcome. So today we've got a really juicy topic, which is all about embracing yourself as an artist. And I I think this has got a lot of rich layers for us to be able to explore. Would you like to give me some of the thoughts that you've got about what's been your experience of accepting yourself as an artist and really embracing that? And has there been layers and stages? Because that's been what I've experienced. So I'm curious Mm -hmm. to hear what do you feel um, is important to talk about in terms of this embracing ourselves as an artist? You know, I so agree with you. Phases and stages, I would say a lifetime. (laughs) A lifetime of really accepting myself as an artist because I continue to wait for someone else to tell me that. Yeah. You know, to give me some kind of sign that I was an artist. I mean, of course, there were there were beautiful little mercy drops along the way. But to me, that is the journey of an artist is really believing in yourself enough to do your art. Yeah. <laughs> and what have been the things that have held you back for you? What what have been some of the challenges or barriers that you've had? You know, those moments when you think something's going to happen and it doesn't happen the way you think it's going to happen. Um, yeah. I was going to get a Grammy by the time I was 40 years old and that didn't happen. <laughs> How about you? Did you have something huge that you were expecting to happen before you could put the stamp of I am an artist on your forehead. I, it's funny because, you know, that that thing about external measures, if you like, has not really been true for me because I've always had a career. And so until maybe two years ago, I really saw myself as a hobbyist, you know, like I had a love of jewellery making and more recently painting, but I really saw it as a side gig and that I had this sort of professional career and something, you know, something changed for me in just in the early 2000s when my life did a pivot and I, you know, we talked about this in the creative journeys that we've experienced. That point at which I decided that I was going to take myself off and learn jewellery and silversmithing and then I went over to Europe and lived in Spain for a number of months that year and just, you know, really indulged in all of that, I still saw it as a part-time gig, you know, like I certainly opened the door a lot more than I had ever previously, but I had this, you know, I still have a, a day job or I still have a, a you know, a career on this. That's the main gig. So I feel like it really only started to become a f- a real issue, the sort of Grammy equivalent only became an issue for me two years ago when I asked myself, what would happen if I put art and my creativity in the center of my world, as in the making of art? So I have a creative business, but it's not the same. It's still consulting. It's a different, it's a different thing, I think. So it's become more of an issue since I've really embraced my art making at the center of my world. And then I've had the equivalence of the Grammy come up for me. <laughs> so that's been a little bit of an evolution though. <laughs> yeah. Can you share it with us? Absolutely. So going back to the original question, the layers thing, I always saw myself as creative, but it was never it was never as an artist. I was just a creative person on the side. And um, what happened was I started to think, well, what do I want to achieve now that I've made this decision sort of two years ago? I really want to dive in and really become serious. Well, I need to win some art awards, don't I? You know, so and last year I did put in for my first two ever art awards with paintings and one of them became a finalist. But I don't know what I was expecting, but, you know, I did enter them with half hope and half I know this doesn't matter. So I sort of was fairly balanced around how much meaning I made to the result. And I think that's some of the things that maybe in other areas I've certainly experienced where if this happens, well, then that means, you know, I'm legitimate or, you know, I I can actually Mm -hmm. own that title. And I think that's very true for a lot of people that I see around their creative pursuits and they're labeling themselves as an artist. 
What do you think? Is that? I think, oh, you know what? I think it's almost easier to do art as a side gig because then you don't have the pressure on your artistry to perform and to make certain things happen in your life. Like let's say you're wanting income to come from your artistry and you really need that income, it's going to be putting a lot of pressure on your artistry. I've been, I have been playing that dance for a long time. You know, that they, the d- decision to become a recording artist, to become, you know, to use songwriting as part of my livelihood has always been supported by something else. And I'm really grateful for that because it's helped me grow in the world, but it's also distracted me. I've had 10 year, you know, distractions, or we could call them detours. (laughs) And then just like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, you know, I remember that moment. I had written already these amazing children's songs for schools in a character building kit form, right? And here I was working for someone else. And there was like one moment in time, once again, that uh, I was sitting there in the sanctuary at Agape and this this man came in to play the game with us. And the question was, if you die in three months, what are you gonna have to do before, you know, what is so important for you to get done before then? And I went like, oh oh my God, you know, I'm gonna have to take this thing and really take it into the goal, down the goal line. I'm gonna have to do this myself. And I just got so clear that I needed to get my music into school districts because that's what I what I had created, but I had just left it on the shelf there. That seems to be kind of a repeating theme for me is I'm, I'm a creative, I will create, but taking your creation to the world almost feels like a whole another place of creating, you know? And I think our barriers to creativity are, they can be anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the barriers because I've I've had a few um, that I can identify and I think that uh, others will perhaps share. One of mine, which was really came home to roost in 2005 when at very short notice I threw a portfolio together and ended up getting accepted into art college. So I was in my, you know, mature years and It wasn't on my horizon necessarily to go to art school, but I love, I'm a lover of learning. So I kind of, it flowed. And what I spotted in the first sort of almost semester of study was, I think I might only have one good idea. What then? What if I literally run out of good ideas and then I'll just be like standing there naked in art college looking like a goof? You know, that was... And, and I didn't actually really recognize that fully until I was sitting in a great talk by Tracy Moffat. She's a, a brilliant photographer and, and visual artist. And she said, some of you out there, you newbies might be worried about this issue. And until she said it, I actually didn't recognize it in myself. But as soon as she said it, I went, wow, that is so true. And she said, don't be worried about that what you need to worry about or what you need to pay attention to because you're actually going to be hounded by ideas. Once you start the creative flow, Mm -hmm. you're going to be hounded by ideas. You need to just pay attention to the one that won't quit after two years. It's still bugging you while you're having your shower. Go after that one. And I remember just having this moment of utter relief that this was not going to be a problem, but it certainly was there in my subconscious that I was trying to take this seriously and possibly this might be an issue for me. So, and I have since found a great quote by Maya Angelou who says, don't worry about creativity drying up. You basically, the more you use it, the more you generate. And that was certainly my experience over several years at art college. I just had ideas coming out the ears, you know, I just could not bottle it. And and that's just a beautiful thing. Mm, I love that. Yes. And you know, the the other thing I would say for me is that taking it to the finish line once again to me it seems like to be i for some reason it's keep coming up today in this conversation for me it's really important for me to finish something because i can start a lot of things <laughs> and my my mind likes to go oh let's do this let's do that oh let's do this but to me the important thing is to finish something and that's just the way i've been created very practical a lot of things come through and i want to get them to the finish point and that and there's nothing better than stepping into like you stepped into art school but even stepping into a simple class of doing something that is 
asking you to do something in a certain amount of time and get it done, I think it's really good for a creative because it gives you a structure that you might really need. So you don't go all squirrely out there in the, I see it as like a silly in the colors of the rainbow and you're just in the formless and you're like, oh, <laughs> am I on the planet? Where am I? <laughs> It sounds like you and I might be a bit wired a bit the same in that I'm always good at the start of projects. Like I love that ideas, that front end. And I always worked well when I had someone else who was really good with details and did the finishing. So I think mm -hmm. that's certainly what you've just described is certainly true for me in life in that I'm really good at the front end and I, and I have lots of ideas, but I have to put, you know, I have to really follow through, as you say, and I think of it as juicing, really squeezing the juice out of everything that you've put into this one concept, take it in as many directions as possible so it can give value or so it can, you know, give return. And I think that's certainly part of the challenge, but that's my personality. And maybe you and I are wired similarly in that we have lots of ideas and good at the front end. Mm -hmm. I think the other one that's plagued me and this is a real confession is that my terror, my inner fear about creating was that I would make stuff that I was happy with, but I would be the only one that wouldn't know that it wasn't any good, that everyone else would look at it and go, oh dear, <laughs> and I would be excited. No one else would be, you know, it would be, my work would suck and I wouldn't know. And that, that actually... <laughs> I think art school might set you up for a bit of that, but I do think that there is definitely that lurked in my subconscious for a long time that I could be naive and uneducated enough to not really be able to be discerning and that that would be embarrassing. And I, I relate to that because, you know, when I listen to say Brene Brown's work around vulnerability, she talks about vulnerability as being at the core of creativity and innovation. And I can really feel mm. that in myself. So, mm. yeah, but luckily, you know, being 55, I've sort of got over that. I kind of don't care anymore at all, yeah. actually, about mm -hmm. what other people think. I just, if it brings me joy and I, you know, it fulfills what I wanted to express, then that gives me joy. And then I just don't care. I figure there'll be one other person possibly who will enjoy it. But if not, it can stay on my wall. <laughs> Did you have have yes. any doubts yourself about oh. not not having the discerning kind of? Oh uh, yes. In fact, when I when I listen back to my very first recordings, I go, "What was it that that girl thought was okay <laughs> with that recording enough to continue?" You know, they were awful. There's, I mean, if I listen to them now, I go, "What was going on?" But it wasn't like it was like something so strong and a desire for me that I had to yeah. do it. Yeah. But something really changed for me when I, because I kept getting disappointed and disappointed and disappointed because people in the world weren't responding to what I wanted. It's kind of like, you know, going on audition after audition, audition, and you don't get the part. For actors, um, a lot of things like that came up for me, but then little openings would happen. And I remember Michael Beckwith, who is one of my teachers saying once, you came here to give a gift to the world. But you can't expect anything back from the world because the world isn't here to take care of you. The universe is here to take care of you. And that kind of set me free that I could just give and give what came naturally to me and it would find a place. And I think yeah. right about that same time I did The Artist's Way. And I, I think, too, this is such a great thing. If you ever get writer's block or you feel like you cannot express in the world, you know, those morning pages and taking myself out on artist dates. I mean, that's a simply the whole program right there of just allowing <laughs> yourself to be, to be like just a thing, you know, just like write and just go and play a little bit with yourself and allow yourself to be in another environment. After I did that, this beautiful drop of writing the virtue songs, which are now called the angel songs for the little ones came in. And I, I've already told this story in, but you know, that was a huge opening for my, oh, this is more like crafting now. Yeah. It's not waiting for the inspiration. It's at crafting the songs. The songs need to be about these specific things. 
So I would get up like five in the morning before because I was a single mom then. And no, I wasn't a single mom any longer, but I was the woman in the household. So, you know, as soon as anybody else is up, I just have that, that thing of like, well, what do you need? So I would get up early and just read these beautiful virtues from this book and knew that the song would start coming through and it would, it start singing to me. And uh, it was just a beautiful experience of, oh, I just craft it now. I don't have to just wait and hope something great will inspire me. It's like, I have a job to do now because this mm. is my gift to give to the world. Mm. I love that separation between looking to the world to be your feedback versus the universe. Actually, I feel, you know, that it's more of a spiritual thing than it is a here and now response. So I feel that, yeah, that's a great bit of advice that you got. And I love that, you know, it's your job to just turn up and to start the work and that that mm -hmm. is what will allow things to come through. I feel the same now that I've got really passionate about my painting. I don't want to spend lots of time thinking about painting. I just want to be there in front of the board or the canvas and have paint on my palette and be moving it around because it's in the process that it happens for me. Mm -hmm. And I think I thought I needed to have these, you know, incredible ideas that were going to just blow the world's socks off. And that's not where it happens for me either. <laughs> it's actually very almost pedestrian in, and I love that because that makes it very doable, but I have mm -hmm. let go of some of that idea of the way that it works. So yeah. have you, have you struggled with comparison? Oh, uh, so much. Um, you know, I love what, um, Emma Curtis Hopkins, she's, she's one of the teachers of teachers that I've studied. And she says, you never can, let's see if I can remember the four C's, no comparison, no competition, no complaining. And what was the four? I can't remember the fourth one at this moment. So sorry. But those have been really helpful for me because as soon as you start comparing yourself with anybody, it just takes you out of your groove. You know, that's what I think our biggest job as artists is to stay in the groove, to stay in that place of creative balance. And if you start comparing yourself to someone else, I started looking, you know, you know, those times in your life when you look at someone and go, oh no, there's just no way. Or you look at them and you start feeling bad about yourself. Those have become really teaching moments for me. They're like, okay, let's look at this again. Where are you not loving yourself as an artist? Where do you need it? It usually is because there is a place that I have been wimping out in, you know, yeah. that they have gone ahead and been bold in their artistry and I've been holding back. Yeah. Yeah. I realize that most of the time I have a reaction because like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm hiding. I'm hiding in here <laughs> and they're not. Oh, how could they do that? <laughs> it's showing me up. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the things that's powerful that I've now come to recognize with Comparitis, which is, you know, looking at, and, and there's so much visual porn, you know, visual eye candy on our phones, on our iPads, on our computer, so much interaction these days through the net. We can see such a lot rather than needing inspiration, taking myself on a artist date and going to the museum and looking at some art. That's a lot more curated. It's a lot more, um, you know, point in time, but now, People can spend two hours a night, every night of the week, just flicking through Pinterest and that can be very damaging. And I think one of the things that I've noticed for myself around doing that is one, I don't do it anymore without certainly not the quantity of time spent, but I, I do do it with much more purpose these days. So allowing myself to go, oh, I really like that work. What about it? really appeals to me. So there's a level of inquiry around, I've seen this painting and I think, oh, wow, that knocks my socks off. What is it that really captures me? Is it the use of color? Or is it the incredibly bold stroke there? Or, you know, what about it really resonates? Because I take that and get inspired and I can leave the rest. So I don't constantly trawl through and almost de-energize myself about 
this you know mm -hmm. you can believe that everybody else is making great art except you so it can be really challenging to do that unfiltered comparison or that unfiltered consuming of what others are doing and so i mm -hmm. feel that yeah comparing the whole i'll never be as good as that type thing uh is is a bit of a challenge i think the other the other one because i started late in life and i put that in inverted commas i think i was in my late 30s when i went to art college i you know really only took up painting seriously at 53. i kind of i missed the bit that said i'm too old because there was enough people in front of me that did amazing things from 50 onwards that really inspired me but i think that I'm too old, I'm too young can be a bit of a burden for people that holds them back from really going, yes, let's, let's dive in. Yes, I agree. I remember having a conversation. I went to the Ukraine in 2013 and I was getting ready to open up my uh, Angels of Abundance Ascension Academy. And I said, but I'm just feeling like I'm too old to be on camera, you know, to this lady who was just around my age. I was in your age then, I think I was what, you know, I was in my mid fifties. Now I'm in my mid sixties and I'm more visible than I've ever been. <laughs> and I, something has just let go, like, who cares? Just like you were talking about earlier. Yeah. You know, it's like, is my job more important than being stuck in my own insecurities and my personal foibles? You know, it's like not as important. It's not as important, but it's taken me a long time to get here because I sought for approval all my life you know if you like this then it's okay you know if it, if if this is good and it's interesting yeah. that you say you know it would be listening to music for me and my husband who is my producer and he listens to music as his solace he listens to music all the time and i find myself pulling away like i don't want to hear everybody else's songs you know there's really something there but i if there's something that catches my fascination though, I will study it. And, you know, what are they doing that's so interesting? You know, why is it pulling me in? But I I hear you. I mean, we all have such different things that draw us, that that inspire us. And I just remember the fourth C, condemnation, <laughs> which is an old timey word. But it's, it's an old word. competition, condemnation, and complaining. Those are the four C's that will always take you out. That's very, that's yeah. a very good platform, isn't it, to remember. And yeah, I think the comparison and complaining, I don't do much complaining, I must admit, my, my, I feel pretty good. I had one moment of complaint last year. And that was in, in a year that was COVID filled. I think I did pretty well. But it was the one moment when I realized if I had procrastinated another few days, the border to the state where I was having my big year long work exhibition was actually going to be open in time. And I spent a whole day <laughs> in a funk complaining to myself and the world. But apart from that, it's been pretty good. I <laughs> and I, I do feel, you know, I think there is, uh, it is good to hang on to the gratitude and the blessings around, around what we we've got. And I'm so grateful for, actually being clearer about what it is I want to say, because really that um, looking to externalities, my one big thing that would have blown me off course in the past was my husband, who is my, you know, best buddy, and he's a great strategist, and he's got a really good mind, knowing that he didn't like my art, when I really got into mm -hmm. it at the beginning of last year. And when when he said, yeah, I don't really like it, you know, it's kind of whatever. I thought, you know, that's okay. I don't mind that you don't like it. It's not for you. And I got on with making and that for me was like a huge neon sign that something had shifted in me that I was okay, that one of the people in this world whose opinion I care most about wasn't positive. Actually, it didn't matter. And about October last year, because Ian also is my framer, bless his cotton socks, he um, took up the framing <laughs> job and he returned a couple of works and he said, your work's getting really good. And I was like, what? <laughs> From a man who does not like abstract art, doesn't like modern art, 
and his comment was he he saw an improvement over the sort of nine ten months that I was making consistently, and so that was you know a piece of feedback, not one I was looking for, but one I gratefully received when it arrived. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know I I love that story. That I love that story. It, it, to me, the most important thing, and it's taken me a long time to get here, and I'm still working on it, is to believe in myself and have faith to believe in myself and have faith. I remember writing the Ho'oponopono prayer chant mm -hmm. and the way it came through was very reverent to me. You know, it was very like a high song. And, you know, Michael, my husband is my producer. So I said, listen to the song. And he goes, oh, Jen, you don't want to do that song. It's like the guys will not get it. They're going to think it's really, you know, it's I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. And he said, it's just too wimpy. Guys are not going to get it. And I actually put it away until we were doing a concert and somebody says, hey, remember that whole Pono Pono prayer thing you, you played for us? Can you do that again? And we did it at the end of this house concert and something magical happened. We all were just lifted up into this holy place, you know, that yeah, was wow. indescribable. And he got it. Yeah, he got it. And then I realized that I had given him power that I shouldn't have. It wasn't his to say. <laughs> and, you've, and you've since recorded it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. So any other barriers or blocks that you recognize that have stopped you from, in the past, embracing fully yourself as an artist? I'm just scanning my thought lists. and I think we've pretty well covered it. Yeah, I think um, the personal insecurities one is really, you know, that goes along with the vulnerability. And I, mm -hmm. I think that there's something gorgeous about being in our, the age that we are now is that that matters so much less. And I feel that, that this is a grand thing, something that I can really rejoice uh, that I'm where I am. I, I just have to say this out loud. Let us acknowledge <laughs> that it takes a lot of courage to be an artist in the world, to put your stuff out there, to, to, to do something that you love and show it to somebody else, put it up for sale, whatever it is, the next step and the next step. It takes a lot of courage. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. So good on you. Good on you, Michelle. Good and on you. All of you beautiful artists Everyone that are listening to this and you, Jennifer, I do think believe it's funny that you use that word several times in this episode because just yesterday I got my letters out on my windowsill and I've got Believe sitting on my windowsill. So when I open my window, my view from my studio is across the cattle yards into the paddock. So I have this beautiful green backdrop and my words and that word, the letters, Believe there because I think that believing in ourselves is a job that only you and you know we can do for ourselves and it underpins so many of these blocks and barriers that when we do believe in ourselves these just fall away and it is possible to more fully embrace and i think i'm on a journey too this is not a here and now i've i've reached a tick um that i can fully embrace <laughs> but i think that there's a you know there's a passage and a process and i can look back you know we were talking very much around our creative journeys. And when I do that around this issue of embracing myself as an artist, I can really see the steps and the stages. And, you know, I love the the feedback that I got. So I just recently ran a women's retreat called Spirit of Woman Creative. And the feedback that I got from the women really made me feel even more kind of anchored in myself around yes, I've got something to offer and yes, I can do this. But I'm just a bit further on the path than those gorgeous women and they're further on the path than some others who haven't yet started. And there's lots of people further down the path of becoming more of themselves and more of their creative selves. So I just feel like mm. it's just point in time and that's a beautiful thing to recognise too that I've got something to help those who are a bit further back but I can also turn and learn and all of it is helping me embrace myself as an artist and being clearer about what the heck I want to say, which is, you know, that this planet is the most precious, precious thing. And we can really 
look at the way that we're interacting and caring for the planet in a much deeper way than I think we have so far. So, you know, that's my message and I really am very excited about being able to share it. And that's also helped me embrace this whole concept of being an artist because I feel like there's something significant that matters for me to say. Mm-hmm. And I think you've got that's beautiful. You've got that message as well, haven't you? Like, you know, you're sharing. Yeah, well, you know, I think we all have that place that we are hoping this beauty that we're bringing, this artistry that we're bringing to the world, which we are, we are the beauty keepers. We are the ones that are bringing the aesthetics to life. It'd be very gray if we weren't here, right? But there is that thing that you long for your work in the world to do. And I I remember people come up coming up to me after I shared my music and say, You you made me cry and I yeah. and you made me feel my heart open. And I said, Thank you for speaking my prayer back to me. Because what an affirmation that is to keep going, you know, yeah. when somebody gets what you're doing and yes. they they receive the gift of it, it just continues to open you up and to make you stronger. Yeah. More belief, more faith. <laughs> That's right. Believe, believe, believe. Just before we finish, I I have one more point, but I think we should hold it over to a much deeper dive. And that's the block and barrier around you don't make money when you're an artist. You know, you'll be poor. You'll be the starving artist if you fully embrace yourself as an artist. And that I think is a significant barrier for people. But because you and I have such a lot to talk about in that one area, I think what do you reckon we hold it over to a future episode? I do, because that's a huge topic. It I think it, is. it really requires its own its own uh, episode. Yeah, yeah, I agree. The, the whole abundance scarcity thing that doesn't just revolve around money, it can be around time. And I think we could really dive into that. So that was the last thought that I had for this conversation about embracing ourselves as artists. And I hope people who are listening There's a few things that we've mentioned. We might put some links below the show notes. For those of you who are listening to this, just reflect on where might you be holding yourself back and what things might you be saying to yourself that really don't have to be true. So embrace yourself as an artist at the next level so that you can bring more of your your original medicine into the world. We need it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Beautifully said, Michelle. Beautiful. You are important. And what you have to express is so important. Yes. And only you can express it. That's the thing that I find just, Mm -hmm. it empowers me. Mm -hmm. So I hope it empowers people who are listening that really you have something very original to share. And part of our job is to find out what that is and get on Mm -hmm. the path to sharing it with the world because it's needed. Walk out on the skinny branches. I love that (laughs) saying. Walk out on those skinny branches and let yourself try something that might be a little scary because it's always so uh, opening to new ideas and finding out more about yourself. Yep. That power of courage and just, as you say, go dance on the skinny branches. Oh, well, thank you for joining me in this conversation, Jennifer. It's been lovely. Lovely to hang out. Oh, yes. I love it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been it's been great, and I look forward to our next conversation. So, bl- sending blessings and love to everyone who's listening. Bye for now. Bye for now. <laughs>